I love that. I love how your beauty is wrapped up in your political. Oh, it's a form of mission. protest. Yeah, my beauty is protest. It's a form of protest mm -hmm. against a notion that would not include you. Like, mm -hmm. how could you not say ebony is beautiful? Correct. And thus you would say black women right. are beautiful. Sure. Yeah. There were so many times when I worked in L.A. as a brief model actress um, that I would intentionally defy my agent and I would go on calls that did not want to see black women that only wanted to see women of multiracial identity, that only wanted to see Hispanic women, that only wanted to see anything but black women, right? And I would go and they're like, but your name is Ebony. Like, I don't, <laughs> and, um, and I would get cast some of the time. And then I get to tell the director, so you know what this means, right? You don't know what black women look like. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what that means. The a ratio. Okay, though. The a ratio. Okay, though. That might be the best question I've ever been asked. <laughs> You's a phenomenal person. I mean, you legendary. I am a fan of you, my brother. My friend Ebony K. Williams is more than a lawyer and a broadcaster at the Grio and a TV judge and a member of Real Housewives of New York. She's more than a woman who told Ianla Van Zant that she would date a bus driver if he owned the bus driving company. She's a brilliant and fascinating woman who is on the verge of trying to about to have a baby. So I want to talk to her about that, about living in the world as a person, who she is, men, moms, all sorts of things. She's a fascinating person. This is an amazing conversation. Let's get into it. It's Ebony K. Williams on Torre Show. Ebony. Go ahead and turn. Are we rolling? How are you? <laughs> I am feeling good in this moment. And that's where I'm at in life, Tori. I'm taking it moment by moment. Are you happy? I'm happy in this moment. What about in general? You know, I will answer you the way I answered my 24-year-old best friend in terms of the friendship's 24 years old, not she is 24 years old. That would be weird because I'm 40. So like, I'm saying, right? What do you have to talk to you about a 24? We can't first talk of all, to about your business story. That's first of all. No, I'm saying. <laughs> um, so <laughs> uh, I was talking to my friend of 24 years and I was saying to her, I am as happy in this moment as I have been overall in life. Okay. Like meaning like professionally, my relationship with my mother, my relationship with my really tight friends, they're better today than they've ever been. And I think that's some, that feels like something to be really happy about. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's some things that could be better. Like what? My fertility journey could be going easier, but, you know, it's called a journey for a reason. You want to have a baby. Yeah. You working on that now? Mm-hmm. You are. What have you been trying? Well, I am in my IVF journey, so I am preparing for my embryo transfer. Um, and I, second week in November right now, in a perfect world, I would be pregnant as we speak. We had a little bit of a false start situation around my um, estrogen protocol. It, you know, without getting into the minutia, I am still trying to get on first base with my actual embryo transfer. But I have an embryo that is healthy and in waiting, and I'm looking forward to transferring You have an it. embryo that's waiting for you. Yes. And you're you're good. Like, you're ready to, like... I wish I was pregnant yesterday. Yeah, and you can be pregnant, and you're going to be great. Thank you. Right? I don't know. Are you the Dr. Negro? I'm not a Dr. Negro. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to have fun. Tori. I'm Come excited. On. I'm excited, too. I mean, you're a father of two. Your yeah. kids are... Tweens? Almost 16 and 14. Okay, no, so it's pure teens. Yeah. What do are you, you wish? Wait, are you ready for, no, no. for having a baby? No, 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 my turn. <laughs> no, 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 no Negro. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to interview you. Um, <laughs> now we're going to ping pong. Um, what do you wish someone would have told you about parenting that you know now that you didn't know before they were conceived? No. Just try to say yes as much as hmm. possible. Including yes to the children. No, I mean, like, to the children. Like, say I, yes I, to yeah. almost everything. That's shocking for me to hear, by the way. I was not raised in a yes household. You did. I was not. You were not. You were I not. was not raised in a household where you were so much allowed to speak <laughs> as the kid. Yeah. Certainly not. I'm, you know, I'm, I was raised in the South. 
by a, a very, very kind of where North Carolina, Charlotte, yeah, yeah. Uh, by way of a meet South Louisiana. Okay. Super strong, single black mother. And I think of our, if I can say our generation, kids were seen and not heard. Right. Right, 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 right. right. Be right, quiet. Right, right. Uh-huh. right, like you are subservient, mm-hmm. or you are you are sub the adults. A thousand percent. Right. Your whole your whole existence is based on deference. The generation mm-hmm. uh, now can be like, I want to be your friend, mm-hmm. or can be like what some would mischaracterize as gentle parenting, mm-hmm. but like. From the beginning. The kids get to be Just human. Try yeah. to say yes to them as much as possible. I like that to her. I mean, I, I don't You don't you don't need like parenting that. does not require you to be like, don't do that, don't do yeah. that, don't do that. Yeah, so and I feel like that's like giving them a lot of the, the freed, Even if they are quote unquote making a mistake, mm-hmm. like and we're not talking about touching the stove, but I'm talking right. about like all the like just picking wrong fr- like you let know what them I mean. Do whatever yeah. they're okay. gonna they're gonna figure it out. It's going to be okay. You know, the thing I think about with new parents, because the kids are stronger, Mm -hmm. more resilient than you know. Both of my children, when they were like under three months and like swallowed up little babies, they were on my wife's side of the bed and in both these different stories. (laughs) And they rolled off the bed Mm -hmm. and hit the floor Mm -hmm. like three months old. And that's like one of those nightmares like, oh, my God, what if the baby rolls off the bed? And then like nothing happened. (laughs) It might have might have been like a little like oh that was weird and you scoop them up and like they're fine and nothing and they're happened fine. yeah okay. and it's just sort of a metaphor for mm-hmm. like things will go outside the lines yeah. and it'll be fine it'll be fine I like that so let set, try to say yes to them as much as possible as much as you can thank you and Tom. I think giving them that freedom mm-hmm. builds self esteem. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. and I think when you have self-esteem and self-belief mm-hmm. and an internal, because a lot of your internal voice comes from what your parents say to you. Sure. And if your internal voice is, I can, I can, I can, mm-hmm. rather than I can't, mm-hmm. which is some people's internal, yeah. right, then you will be propelled more, I think. Lovely. Thank you. I think your, I feel like your internal voice is like, I can do anything. It is. But <laughs> I will say based off of, and I love this dialogue already, it came later in life than probably most would think because I was raised in such a see and not be heard way. Now, that said, what she did do really well alongside that was model. Badass. I can do anything. Yes. So while I wasn't executing, I can do everything at nine or 12 or a- even that's 18. Oh, that's what I was seeing. So much of what the mm-hmm. kids get from the parents is seeing what they mm-hmm. do, not like what you say to them mm-hmm. is secondary. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I saw a black woman that could do anything and be in conversation with anybody. And she kind of represented so many things that America and globally she wasn't supposed to. She's not, you know, formally educated in a collegiate way. She's not wealthy. She's not white. Gloria. And she is the most badass, get your... Can you curse on here? Sure. Most get your motherfucking ass together woman you will ever meet in life. Um, and that's all I that's all I know. That's so when it was my time, when I got an opportunity to finally step into a voice of my own, an, an occupation of space of my own, that was the only way I knew how to occupy space. Yeah, I I, I mm-hmm. sense a lot of self confidence coming out of you, mm-hmm. and some people derive self-confidence from I did this mm. so I'm confident that I got a PhD I published a mm. book I work at such and such place mm-hmm. and from you I get I'm badass I believe in me the whatever mm-hmm. you know JD whatever else sure. yeah I knew I was badass before mm-hmm. I got a law degree before this mm-hmm. happened mm-hmm. well because I wasn't supposed to be here it's at least what the psyche Okay. Um, mom from rural Louisiana, uh, so, like to the point where if we went to where my mother was raised, Torrey today, it's a little town called Mount Pillar, Louisiana. It's in Tangebaho Parish. It's as segregated in 2023 as we would envision 19. It's like Bull Connor to, the, to this day. So the fact that I was able to, by proxy of her really smart life choices, getting us out of that terrain— uh, being a zealous educational advocate for me. So 
gifted and talented programs and, you know, lots of controversy there, but, but, the, but whatever was available to like a first class existence for American life was going to be available to me. And Gloria made sure of that. Um, so to her large credit, I wasn't, I was supposed to be pregnant and on some type of shit and mm. you know I just wasn't supposed to be in the space mm. so by virtue of just being here I've already kind of overperformed yeah I think is a lot of my feeling so I'm playing with house money the JD is house money the you know that's how you feel about yeah your life. the I'm writing ahead. the first book the writing the second book the being colleagues with you on the Grio, yeah. the having the daytime syndicated judge show, being the youngest judge on air right now, the being the historic first black woman to be on Real Housewives of New York. It's all house money, Tori. I've already won. Now give me the house. <laughs> yes. Give me the house. Give it to her. Mm -hmm. So, yes, I've known you for a long time. Mm -hmm. When I saw the, <laughs> the, the bus driver mm -hmm. thing with Yanla Van Zant, mm -hmm. right? And what was... Ianla initiated it, right? She asked you, mm -mm. how did it, how did that? That was my ask. So I, uh, being a frequent, uh, as much of a fan as a frequent guest on The Breakfast Club, yeah, I saw Ianla on The Breakfast Club and she made a statement. And I'm paraphrasing, but not very much. It's almost exact. exact. Ianla Von Zant said, young, black, no, not even young, a lot of black women today mm -hmm are operating as men in skirts. They are occupying a masculine posture in their relationships and in society, and it needs to stop. And I... I don't know what that means. You said you don't know what that means? No. I oh, I know exactly what she meant, Tori. What, what she meant? What she meant was, and she did expound, basically she's saying women... And I'm putting my hand in the air. I, You know, what did they say? Uh, you know, hit dog holla. I was hit. <laughs> I was like, oh, this one's for me. Dr. Von Zant says women today are so preoccupied by building and protecting and providing and making the money and being the boss and being overeducated and overemployed and all of that, that they're too busy occupying spaces that are traditionally for men. And so while we look Feminine, we've got our lashes and we've, some of us have our BBLs and all of the things. I'm just, you know, that's what you're saying. And our Balmain, our, our uh, Christian Louboutins. Aesthetically, we present feminine, but in terms of core values and how we show up in the world, we are masculine. We are providing, we are building, we are taking care of versus uh, relaxing into our feminine energy and being taken care of. So instead of being taken care of, we are taking care. And she was challenging us uh, to do better as and, women. And the implicit thing is you're only going to get a man when you're in your feminine energy. Correct. Correct. And I was not in disagreement. And that hurt you? No, it's not. No, it didn't hurt me. To Did erase. you feel reflected in that comment? Absolutely. I felt like I was the exact type of woman Ayanla was referring to. Is that happening in your life that men are repelled because you are as strong and as making as much money and Well, I don't know if they are repelled, but I know I am repelled. Um You are repelled <laughs> by I am repelled because I I feel challenged in meeting and partnering with a man that I feel can protect and provide for me as well as I can do for myself. Mmm, I can take care of myself. So why do I need you? No, I I would love to need you, but you have to overperform. See what I'm saying? Like like Does he have to retire you? No. Does he have to come in equal to you? He had to come in equal to me. And Ayan was saying, well, if we as as these skirt wearing men, <laughs> if we relaxed off of doing basically she's saying we're doing too much. She's saying women today are doing too much. They are over indexing. And they are doing the traditional roles that men should be performing. So you continue that conversation on your Grio show. Yes, because I wanted to learn, right? My question to her, so what led to Bus Driver, because I'm going to get there. She 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 says what she says. I says, Dr. Von Zahn, I find it fascinating. I don't disagree. I You are my, and I, with full respect, elder, right? Sure. You are a veteran. Sure. Uh, I think Ayanna's almost 70 years old, right? You are someone that I She's am in wise. a posture of learning from. Sure, sure, sure. 
So when you say this, I want to better understand, what do you recommend woman to woman, elder to sure. mentee? Teach me, Ayanla, what should women like myself be doing when we are afraid? We are afraid, Dr. Von Zant, that if we don't go get it, go to school, go to more school, yeah. get all the degrees, yeah. get the big jobs, make the two, three, five million dollars a year, yeah. buy the house, uh, which I have now done in Harlem, right? Buy my real estate, Ooh. have my baby. Buy. If I don't do all of that, I am afraid, Dr. Von Zant that I will be without it right? because I'm not seeing enough evidence with right. my naked eyes right. of the quantity of men being able to step into that posture for me. Right. I'm looking right. at my sister to the left. I'm looking at my sword to the right and I'm seeing women without, and I'm not going to be without, I'm going to just tell you, you know me a long time, you know, <laughs> I'm never going to be without. <laughs> so therefore, so therefore I am afraid to trust what you are suggesting which is if you wait, he will come. Right. If you do less, it will be provided for you. I want to believe that with everything in me, Torrey. I right. still want to believe that. Right. But I am afraid because it it's kind of Baldwin-esque, right? You know how Baldwin says in that famed debate with a um, oh, white boy, um, you are asking me to believe in, <laughs> in, 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 in an America that yes. I have no evidence William, of seeing. William Buckley, yes. Yo, yes. A white boy. Yes, right. yes, yes. Uh -huh. For sure. For sure. <laughs> um, and, and that's kind of how I felt in that moment. Like, I, I hear you, along, uh, uh, I hear you, Ayanla, and I want to believe in this man coming to save us yeah, as yeah. black women, but I've not seen I'm the not evidence it. of it. Not seeing not it. Not even in my own family. Right. Not even my own father. So then. And then she says, would you date a bus driver? <laughs> And you and the whole shit went left. Said, no, it didn't go left with that. Mm -hmm. It went left as far as making it into a cultural moment. Right. When you said, if he owned the bus. So you said, I took it left. I'm not saying left is a negative. Yeah. You, that, the response. It's the response. So it was, made wasn't the it, question. It was the, the question response. made it an interesting moment. Mm -hmm. But the response then tapped into all these things that the generations sure. and the genders are saying about dating. And I completely was with you. Tell I was more. like, I'm, she's I'm so I'm very right. curious to hear from, especially a married man yeah. um, and a family man, your perspective. Well, I don't have a problem with a woman saying, I want to get as much as I can out of the dating market. Mm -hmm. And I aspire to somebody who owns a company rather than somebody who just works at a company. Mm -hmm. I thought you as a person, you're a multi-hyphenate. You're always doing three to five things <laughs> at once. Mm -hmm. So that shows a lot of ambition and a lot of thought and able to flow in lots of different circles. Yeah. If you, sir, mm -hmm. are existing in one circle, mm -hmm. I just drive this bus. There's nothing wrong with driving a bus, but you only do one thing. Mm -hmm. So you're showing a certain level of ambition, a certain level of comfort mm -hmm. of just doing one thing mm -hmm. rather than being one of those people who's like, I, I need to think of something else and something else and something else. Mm -hmm. I can do more. So that's not a very good fit. Somebody who only does this one thing versus somebody who does five, th right? Like, I mean, At the, once, the yeah. people who do five things are kind of extraordinary, right? Like it's, it's, it's a fringe position in the world. Fringe is a good word. So, yeah. so it's you know not, I it's like not fringe, a fit. Just to stop for one second, because yeah. I think it's really important what you're saying right now, Torrey. Fringe just means different than most. Right. It you know what it doesn't mean? It doesn't mean better than. No. It doesn't mean more valuable than. But also, it doesn't mean any of that. It just means different than. I know you yeah. are like, let's go to Paris. Let's go to Jamaica. Let's go to the museum. Mm -hmm. Let's do, let, you know, let's go to, let's, we can go to the Jay-Z concert. Let's also go to the opera or the ballet or whatever. Sure. Yeah. If somebody is not there, and I'm not saying a bus driver isn't necessarily there, but we have, I have to know, mm -hmm. well, who is he? Mm -hmm. Is he the kind of guy who likes and is able to say, mm -hmm. let's go to Paris, fine, let's go sure. to Jamaica, let's go to the, op whatever. Like, I have to I have to know, yeah. right? I'm I'm not sure, mm -hmm. right? Uh, off the bat, I'm like, I'm not sure that we're going to get that. Well, the notion of fit, I think, is really important. And I don't think enough time in this broad, like, 
conversation that, that snowballed from Bus Driver Gate. I, I think people like to say things like, if he loves his mama and he's a good person and he's a good man and he has good values. But I don't think we're unpacking values, mm-hmm. right? So when we say good values, what are good values to me might look very different than what are good values to you. Someone might say good values. I'll prove it to you. Someone may say good values is someone who gets up in the morning, works their job, sure. works their 40 hours per week, yeah. and retains the majority of their time and energy for their family. Someone might say that is good values. That is. And it is. And also, I would submit good values could be that person that maybe doesn't have as much, you know, quantitative time for um, that level of engagement with friends or family. But they're going to get it in a different way because they're doing five things at once. They're, you know, they're managing these different things at one particular time. And that's their value system. Like I had, I have a, a, another best friend um, whose father is an emergency room physician. And so he was not the, the dad that was at dinner every night at six o'clock. Right. No. Why? Because this was a man who worked uh, three days in a row. So I don't know what the hours is. I went to law school. Not, I don't have an MBA. Okay. But he works three days nonstop yeah. in a row and then he would be off for two and then back on and back on. And you know, those types of schedules. Yeah. I think that was a man of high values. For sure. But he's probably not going to be well fit with a woman or man who is preferring of a value system that says we prioritize quality time as a family. Yeah, let's, I mean, See let's what I'm also be yeah. real that when we have a class mismatch in a relationship, yeah. that can be difficult. Mm-hmm. We can have a hard time if we come from different classes. So Already. we have entirely different approaches to money mm-hmm. from where we grew up, even though now we're both middle class or whatever. Mm-hmm. But what you're doing and achieving, right? You're upper middle class, right? Mm-hmm. Let's be real. If you're driving a bus, mm-hmm. you're not upper middle class. You're probably in New York City. You're probably not middle middle class. No, you're probably working at working class aspiring to Middle class. Yes. yes. And that is a different world mm-hmm. and a different language in many ways mm-hmm. than what you're talking about. Yeah. And like, let's be real. Marriage begins as an economic institution mm-hmm. so that wealthy families can combine their wealth and keep it going. The I think notion that's that, already controversial. Too, the right? notion that it should be just about love mm-hmm. and we shouldn't think about how much this person is making or what they might make or their relationship to money. I don't want to marry somebody who is – uh, an, an uncontrollable spendthrift and yeah. we're constantly in, in debt. debt because she can't stay out of, uh, you know, Neiman Marcus Bo- or Bloomingdale's yeah. or whatever, yeah, Barney, yeah. you know, like, I mean, mm-hmm. come on. Yeah. I think that what you're suggesting though is like very rational and very reasonable. And I don't think that's where people tend to land on these conversations. For I'm sure. going to be candid with For you. Sure. I think the notion of even but, suggesting, but, but this is, but this was talked about a lot that yeah. what Ianla mm-hmm. was suggesting was that you go out of your class Mm -hmm. and accept somebody who is in a different class than you. Mm -hmm. And you were saying, no, I want somebody who's in my class or at least trying to be. And that also loves his mama. And that also, and I think that is another thing that really I think was um, problematic in the way in which the cult, the conversation between Ayanla and myself evolved and also the broader conversation, right? Is that there's this default uh, silent assumption that people that do better financially are bad people. Are bad people. Yeah. I think, and that's what, that's when the, you watch too many Tyler Perry movies of it all comes into play, right? <laughs> this notion that if oh, you. Oh, that, that poorer people are inherently, better, inherently good better people. people. And I think that if we're going to go deep, deep, I think this is very like black Christian church, right? Like I think mm. I, I, I'm, I'm not the best with my Bible, but there's some kind of scripture that says something around the, take of it's harder for a camel to go through the Mm -hmm. eye of a a needle needle than for a rich rich man man. to get into heaven. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of us are still very much there. Mm. So that when you start to do better financially, when you start to have the, 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 the JD and the MBA, and by the way, it's not just about the degrees because I've dismissed many a mediocre lawyer, but that's another conversation for for another day, you know? Right. But anyways, I think that we tend to default to a posture of if you earn too much, if you do too well in this category, you must be a shitty person. You must That's be abusive. But 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 I think we see it, Torre. Wait, what is the res- what was the response to? Because that was a hugely <laughs> viral moment. Beyond, it's still existing. You know. So what what did it feel like, and what did you hear coming back at you from the culture? Yeah, 
a lot. <laughs> uh, but everything, listen, but also uh, a 360. Like, I live in Harlem. Um, I love Harlem. I own in Harlem. And I would have women who were little old black church ladies in Harlem that were in their 70s, and they would approach me as I'm go- going into the Rite Aid or the CVS. Miss Ebony, you were absolutely right, sis. You know, and then also um, I had an MTA driver because I'm very I live by the train. Oh, I love the train. One of my favorite things about New York City is sure. I take the train. And I had a, a gentleman who was a um, conductor on a uh, on a train, and he fake closed the door, and he was like just playing sis. I'm. <laughs> I saw sure. what you said about yeah, it. Yeah, so. yeah, 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 yeah. I'm gonna let you on, but and, I saw. And also, I hear you. And also, I already know that if I'm going to approach a woman at your station in life, pun intended, right? Um, <laughs> you so stupid pun intended. But I have to because I'm really a nerd, though. But that's part of it too. Is that like also this bus? You're a this, nerd. This mythical. Wait, you said you're a nerd. Hugely, Torrey. You know this. You're a nerd. I'm a big. Freaking black nerd. I played jazz. I played saxophone and jazz band. I had brace. That that is who I am. So for as much as Ayanla and the conversation focused on my rejection of this mythical bus driver, yeah. this mythical bus driver would likely reject me as well, because my interest very well might be off putting to him, because I am a workaholic. Because I am constantly building and thinking of different ways and um, paradigms f- to advance my business. I was here for two seconds, met. Yeah, Chris, yeah. <laughs> runs you know, yeah. wheels are spinning. How annoying see, is I, that to somebody that it, that doesn't function that way? See, this is what I'm talking about, that I see you as half of a power couple. Mm-hmm. And not like with a man who's like, you know, I have a nice little job. I'm, I'm, I'm cool in this little space of the world. And Mainly, you're like, yeah, because you're I like, think I would be. Do you want to run for mayor? Mayor? Because I'm well, we, like, you. Listen, what we're your, doing, and I think that is. Or I might run for mayor. You going to support me? <laughs> <laughs> well, and it's also like, listen, I Charlamagne asked me one time on the Breakfast Club separate interview, like, what do you bring to the table? Right. You, yes. Ebony. Yes, and I wasn't offended because I think I actually thought it was legitimate, Torre, because I don't think you can assume that just because somebody has these letters behind their name or this check that that is no. What do I bring? I will tell you one of the most valuable things I think I bring to a part a romantic partnership, Torre. And I'm just coming through a heteronormative lens because I happen to be heterosexual, mm-hmm, but mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. if you are a man and you are truly desirous, and I'm speak, speaking very specifically. If you are truly desirous of being the very best maximized version of yourself, Mm -hmm. you could not have a better partner than me. I will get you there. I I put my life on that. But if you are a man and you are looking to kind of find a point of comfort and that, I am probably not the best suit for you because I'm going to push you to the brink. You are going to... Okay, you're gonna make your man better. Yeah, I mean that's the only way I know how to do it, and and I'm not saying that's the only way to love. I'm not saying that's the best way to love. It's just that is how I am hardwired, Torre. And I'm the same way in my friendships. I have an Instagram post from like seven years ago that's like I'm pushy as fuck. Like if you are my best friend, you are my sorority sister, you are my home girl, and you say, sis, I want to go into uh, personal finance advancement, honey. Sit down, but we about to we about to make the game plan. We about to work it out. We're about to see who we know. You look through your phone. I'm looking through my phone. We're gonna I'm gonna get you there. I'm not the person to talk about pipe dreams to. Because I don't do pipe dreams. I'm an executor. So what what it is that you want out of life from a philanthropic place, from a civic place, from a financial place, from a personal growth place. I want to work on my childhood trauma. Let me tell you about the Hoffman Institute, honey. It's f- life changing. I'm a graduate. Let me let me introduce you to some class. Like I just I'm an I am an I have a bias towards action, Torre. And it's something that I think is of enormous value. But if your values aren't aligned with that and you are someone who kind of prefers to be in a place of comfort, it's I will be fit. the most hellacious partner you ever met in your life. Yeah. Because I don't do comfort. You're asking me to be something I don't want to be. Correct. Versus like you want me to you want somebody who's gonna lift you up, I'm gonna help lift oh, you up. Honey, if you're trying to go there, I am the best thing God ever made. Wait, what does it take? What would it take mm-hmm. to be your man? To get to like I mean, even let's let's take it even more granted, just to get to like a third date. Like probably like, not as much as you think. The way you well, ask that question. What, what, to get what's to, on your let's list? Let's talk about a first date. A first date. I'm looking for only two things. 
do you not physically turn me off? <laughs> you don't have to physically turn me on. You know, just he don't a question turn and me he, off. Don't turn me off. Just don't turn me off physically. But do, they don't have to turn you on? No, not on a first date. Okay. First date, don't turn me off physically. And can I have fun with you? I live a very high octane, intense, stressful life by my own choosing, might I add. Sure. My man, first and, and, and second, play date. He's my playmate. Can we play together? Can we have fun? Can we enjoy? Can we laugh? Can I be silly? Can I be a nerd? Can I be goofy? Yeah, that's a first date. How do we get to a second and does third have, date? Does he have to pay? On the first date, yes. For sure. Yeah. And second, too. For sure. I might pay for drinks on the third date, though. On a third date? It's a little early. I've heard that, too. I've heard, I've heard people tell early. me, quiet as kept, I do too much too soon. I once tried to tell the boys mm -hmm. back when Twitter was still a thing, mm -hmm. if when you go on the first date, when the bill comes, don't look at it. Just put down your card. Mm-hmm. Don't scrutinize the bill. Mm -hmm. Oh, what if they made a mistake? Oh, they... <laughs> That's funny. It's That's way funny. more gangster yeah. to just, just put down, I didn't even look at the bill. Yeah. And I'm going to tell you this, they may surprise some. We don't have to go to a two, three course meal on a first date for me. Would you go to Cheesecake Factory on a first date? Of course you're going to ask me that. <laughs> if, if we're in Alabama... Not in New York City. Not in New York City. It's too, many too many options. Too many options. And also, by the way, we don't have a Cheesecake Factory in Manhattan. No, I don't think For the do. record, I don't we don't. Think we do. But um, do but but do we have to be six feet tall? Do we no. have to have a? Do we have to own a company or have no. a thing? Something we you have don't to be, have to be six feet tall. First of all, uh, see, but we have to be jamming. What right? does that mean? I, I mean, like, mean. I have to be like, have I got to have it going on to be of interest. To I mean, like, you have to have some power. Yeah. Yeah. Now. You talked about six feet tall. I don't. I personally don't give a fuck about that. That's okay. that's just me. Okay. I don't care about that at all. You can Does be have to five make a nine. Amount? Make a certain amount. Yeah. Yeah. Um. And I'm gonna tell you what my threshold for that is. It's different today than it was two years ago. You don't have to be a gazillionaire. I just don't need that. I need you to be able to share, participate equally in my lifestyle, which is what you alluded to earlier, right? Right. So if I have, you know. Uh, we're in the same industry. If we have a colleague and she happens to be getting married in the south of France, right? We, I, we I, I would like you to go with me, and I would right. like to not have to pay for your part. Right. You don't have to pay for my part. Right. I got my part. Right. Just pay for your part. Right. And that requires a certain income where we live. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. White, black, Asian, anybody? Any um, anybody with a caveat. Um, I've been very public that I have dated across the racial spectrum since law school. Um, my most recent fiance was uh, a white presenting Jew. At this point, um, I do think I, I would be con I would prefer a black identifying man because never more so in my entire life. I've been black since the day I was born. My name has been Ebony since the day I was born. I have a degree <laughs> in black studies. I mean, I've, no, I say that to say I've always lived a very black conscious life. Mm -hmm. But just the, the the way shit has worked out <laughs> the past several years, I do believe it would be very difficult for me, Torre, to to intimately connect and feel truly safe with a man who did not participate in black identity alongside me. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, I yeah, I know. I, I, I feel you. I feel you when you have certain moments. Mm -hmm. In life, you want to know we are aligned. We don't have to talk. We've had similar experiences. And you get it on a on a on a whole different level than than ne than needs to be articulated, right? So I've always even the the non black men I've dated have been conscious enough to understand that it's the center point of my life, right? But I find through lived experience that there is still some dissonance between an intellectual understanding of blackness yeah. and a lived experience understanding sure. of blackness. For sure. For sure. So I think at this point that that is, that is a deep preference what for me. What are the things that turn your head in a man? Mm. What do you want to see? I want to see a man who uses his privilege for good. I'm talking about You talking aesthetically? Yes, I'm talking about yes, I'm talking about aesthetically. When you you walk so in, so you're a, asking me who looks good to me right now, like in the in the universe, uh, Col I'm, Coleman Domingo. I'm not, I'm not I'm not necessarily asking you to name individuals. Oh, okay, because we can do that. 
I'm, I, but I know that there are things that grab me about okay. women. I'm sure there are things that grab you. I look for a man who people are gravitating towards and not women necessarily. I'm looking, I'm looking for the leader of the pack. So I am attracted to a man. He could be five, nine. Like there's a man in real life right now who on a good day, he might be five, nine. But when he's in the room, everybody's almost lining up literally to get some time with him. That shit's sexy. That shit turns me on. Because that's the man whose lens is the driving force of the vision. I, I, I like a visionary, Torre. I like a man with some excellent. I like a man who, when I come home from an, an, a, an average everyday experience, and I say, listen, sweetheart, I'm, I'm managing, I'm, I'm contemplating this move and this move and this and, and how this plays out. And I want a man, Tori, that can actually advise me. Who can say? Wait a minute. What? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait. I was I was with you until then. Okay. I was. Well, you can and, go where the hell you want to go. I'm well, no, I, I want to push back on that one second because I, 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 I totally mm -hmm. understand. Mm -hmm. I want alpha man. Do do most women have that reaction to the alpha man? Don't no. no? No, I don't think most women. I think me and most women don't go together. I think. <laughs> No, I, I'm, I'm really serious. But isn't yeah. alpha what most women are attracted to? I don't think, not necessarily. I, I'm looking, okay. it's just thinking about the women that I know that are partnered and married. Yeah. Not necessarily. I think a lot of women are attracted primarily to physical. I think they're, they're, they're leading with that. Okay. Yeah, like first and foremost, you, you have to look good to me. Now, I know that... We have some time. We'll be five more minutes. Thank you. There, I know. Just because this that, is fun. Wait. <laughs> <laughs> I I have known several awesome women mm -hmm. who were married to record business alphas. Yeah, titans of industry. Titans. Yeah. And, you know, like you're a record business guy. Like you're, you're cool. I mean, the like head guys who were like cool and running things in the mm -hmm. 90s, whatever. They, they were like, the last person I want advice from is my husband. Like, I want him to be strong and tough. and But tell other people shit. I don't want, I don't want your oh, advice. Oh, I didn't say he needed to run me, Torre. What I mean, though, is... <laughs> when I want advice, he can give it to correct. me. Correct. In the same way that if I look at most of my female friends, they can't always advise on the same topic areas. But, sis, if I can't be like... I don't know. Like, if I... I need to trust your judgment. I guess this is a judgment issue, Torre. Can you say what happened with your fiance? I can answer questions. What you want to know? Why did you walk away? Mm. I guess the three biggest answers. I walked away because we got to a place where I wanted to create family. And it was very clear we had a 13-year age gap in addition to being... He was 13 years younger than you? <laughs> no, Negro. He was 13 <laughs> years older than me. That was cute, though. He was 13 <laughs> years older than question. me. In addition to our cultural gap, him being white presenting Jew, me being black American, we had that age gap. He had three children. You do have to be, I do have to be older than you to get a date with you. Yeah. 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 It's true. Okay. So that you're like, it only be these two things. Nah, I have to be taller than you. I have to be well, older I'm five than you. Well, I'm 5'3", Torre. So <laughs> come on. <laughs> Go on. Um, and yes, my D, I can't imagine dating someone younger. And I really struggle with dating men my own age because I really am an old soul. Like, and I, I'm an only child, so I'm not accustomed to talking to peers. Mm. I'm talk. I'm used to talking up. Only children are different in that way. Yeah, yeah I only engage sure. with adults since sure. I was like seven. Sure. So, uh, yeah, he was 13 years older. He had three boys ages, I think, like 10 to 15 when I met him. What became more and more clear as we went on in the relationship, it was four years total. He he had his family. He had his family. And he did not okay. have an interest in creating new family with me or even expanded family with me. You he, wanted family and he's like, I've already done that. Correct. And this is why That's one hard. of the reasons that I'm having my child on my own. Why? Because the type of men that I am attracted to tend to fall into that category. They've already had families. They already have families. A lot of them have vasectomies right now, if we were just telling the truth about it. Well, mm -hmm. How many 45-year-old men have never been married and have no children? 
I mean, like most men have at l- done right, at least right. one or I, the th- other. So you're making, yes. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Right? Most of the men you're going to date who are a little to a lot older than you. Right. Have already done that. They've yes. already started their families and most of them have already completed their families. Right. And they're not interested at 48 or 52 or 55, Starting which is over. my new cat, of, of staying up with a I, newborn. I can't, I can't be any older than 55. That, and that's new. It used to be that you could be, but I found that that's... Now you're, it's getting caretakerish. So 45 to 55? Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that man is not trying to stay up with a newborn no. all night. No. And who could blame him, I by the that. way? I dig it too. I, I did it. Oh, you did it. I did it. Yeah, I, you I already did, did it. Yeah, so did you're that. not doing it again. Yeah. Correct. So that's one of the reasons that I find that, that we ended. Because he did not want more family. And I love you to death. He loved me. To, we did not have a love problem. Right. We had a we don't want the same thing problem. Right. Another problem we had was he did not do uh, to me an effective job of requiring a certain level of space and respect from his semi-adult children. So by the time our relationship was on its tail end, his oldest two boys were like 19 and 22. Mm-hmm. Um, and they just they just weren't very respectful young men, which, you know, they weren't respectful to you. They weren't respectful to women, period. But your family. No, he didn't do that, though, Torrey. That's what I'm saying. He didn't. Did they say wild shit to you? They just talked. Wild. They, they were teenage boys and they, they talk crazy, you know, and then, frankly, there's the cultural gap, right? Where, mm. you know, sometimes white people, kids talk different. <laughs> You get me in so much trouble, by the way. But anyway, uh, you're like, <laughs> I'm not doing anything. But it's true. But also, I think kids just are different these days. So I did not feel, because I feel like the children follow suit to the to the adult leadership, right? Sure. These kids will respect me exactly as much as you require them to. Spe- speaking to my fiance at the time. And he was yes. a, a bit afraid of his own children. He operated, let's go full circle to how we started the conversation. He operated in a friend's first posture. He wanted to be cool like his sons. He wanted to be at the Travis Scott concert with his sons. He wanted to be in, you know, at the literally taking your boys to Taylor's, whatever, whatever. That was his primary focus was to be liked by his sons. I don't give shit about no kids liking me. You will respect me first and then we'll get to the like. And so we were not aligned. And that didn't happen. That didn't happen. Yeah, I understand that. Yeah, and it's, listen, this, these things are very difficult. I mean, I probably stayed a year and a half longer than I should have because so much love was there, and then I realized I needed to just choose me. Wait, your mom voted for Trump, though? No, she actually didn't cast a vote, but she was a Trump supporter in 2016. Why? You're, it's so funny. You don't remember this, but I remember this. We talked about this on a panel in Philadelphia leading into the 2016 election. Why? Uh, the same reason the 20% of black men are supporting Trump right now. Uh, because she feels that as a small business owner, that she is more connected to a political narrative that talks about the uh, the, the people economically left behind. Um, she felt like, well, if Trump can beat the IRS for himself, he can beat the IRS for us. Um, d- d- She's still with Trump now. No, of course not. What do you mean, of course not? Well, she saw that he once he actually got in office. I mean, some of us saw this before, in fairness. Um, I think she You didn't vote for Trump, did you? No, neither. I, 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 I don't voted. know the way you're covering it now. I'm like, I, I, I trust but verify, Ebony. <laughs> Okay. First of all, <laughs> you asked a question I had to be sure. that I think really is legitimate, which is why would someone with black identity and conscious mind vote for Trump? And we can make a mockery of it if we want to. I think that is not wise. I think we need to look at the fact that 20 percent of black men in America today are saying they are voting for Trump if the election is tomorrow, because that's real. That just was in a re- last week's New York Times. Don't roll your eyes. No, I'm not. I'm not rolling my eyes. I'm not rolling yes, my eyes. Yes, you are literally rolling I, your I, eyes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm rest- see. I don't <laughs> see. It's the bullshit. That's why. They, that's why they voting for Trump because you uppity that's Negroes. Yes, it is because you uppity Negroes are dismissive towards them. I'm glad we talking about this. Y'all are dismissive towards them, and they feel left behind. They do. I think I. I you know I have yet to find a truly principled black male Trumper who's not insane. I have. I have. 
I have. I think you need to go out more and you need to go to um, the cigar bars. But like, you need to go to start, these men. But you start talking to them about like, why do you support Trump? And they start to say things that aren't true. No, they don't say things that aren't true. I mean, they say things that are true for them. No, but the, but truth is truth is not just whatever you think it is, whatever I think, like, like there's, there is knowable things, and they start saying things that are not true. That's and I'm fine. Like, oh, okay, I, okay, so, so you they'll support say Trump some, in a fantasy. Okay, fine. Regardless, that's where the vote's going to go, right? So we can, I hear you, and we can tease out the, well, how much shit was he supposed to give to HBCUs? And we know none of the money ever made it there. And, you know, I'm with you on that. But 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 I am also, as a black woman who, I'm a single issue voter. So let me be very clear. What is clear. your single issue? The federal judiciary. So. What do you mean by the federal? The Supreme Court. The, the Supreme Court is your one issue. And, uh, and the district courts. The f- right. And those federal appointments that only come from a United States president. Right. So therefore, since that's my concern, I will— Is there an issue, a Supreme Court issue that you are focused all on? All of you, them, Torre, you, you Roe just, versus Wade, yeah. affirmative action, yeah. they're all going to come back. You just want to see one. the court going left. I need to see a court that's going towards liberation. I need right. to see it right. Right. So, so I need, but, but that's progressivism, correct? No, I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that semantic game with you because now. Well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Yeah. Wait, when you say a court that's going toward liberation, you're talking about women's it right could, to it, choose, right? I'm talking about women's right to choose, but that, that, that could also be a certain about, level. Are you, are you, are you it, talking it, about affirmative action? I'm talking about affirmative action, but I'm also talking about a certain level of gun rights. I'm talking about liberation. Wait, For me, wait, gun rights being I believe gun, people who want to have guns can do pretty much whatever absolutely. they want. Absolutely, and that's I'll, what you want. I are you going? Let me answer the question. No. <laughs> okay. I want an America that allows for people, especially people that look like me and you in this conversation, yeah. to be able to have a right to defend ourselves with arms when that is required. And I want a Supreme Court that says nobody needs a magazine with thirty clips in it. Okay. 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 So that's the Supreme. So that's why I'm, I'm Are you like, a gun owner? I'm going to, if we live in New York, if I could be a gun owner, I would be a gun owner. I have been the victim of a sexual assault here in Manhattan as recently as 2022. So I do, but my grandfather, Kerry James Williams, never went anywhere without a shotgun. He was a black man in Jim Crow, Louisiana. I don't know how far we are from that existence. So yeah, I believe in the right to self-defense. So that that's why when we start talking about progressivism, but everything you're well, I mean the that's just one example. I think you're you the first two issues you were more lefty, mm-hmm. right? The gun issue, I think you tr- you tend lean more righty, but not all the way. Correct. But, you know, um, so you're. So I'm a reasonably minded American, Torre. Oh, good lord. <laughs> I mean, what? How about that? Can you imagine <laughs> they still lord. make us? Oh, good lord. That. <laughs> How do we get down this path? <laughs> what were we talking about before we got to this? Oh, single issue voter. We're talking about black men and voting for Trump. We were talking about because I was saying that my mother is indicative of many of that, many that held and hold that view at one time. Um, when you look back on Real Housewives, oh, Jesus. happy you did it? Yes, very happy I did it. Despite the trauma? <sighs> yeah, despite the trauma. Um, I'm also happy I did Fox News despite that trauma, you know? Um, I'm happy I went to law school despite that trauma. <laughs> you know, what the fuck are we talking about? Yeah. <laughs> Anything else? <gasps> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I am. Do you enjoy it? Real Housewives? Yeah. No, I can't even, no, not at all. What I enjoyed was the impact. I yeah. enjoyed... The being able to represent what I still stand by was a beautiful. I looked really good the whole season. <laughs> and that was really important. I don't give a fuck what nobody say. It's very important to be a good looking black woman in America. Um, I also was a super principled black woman on that show from beginning to end. Uh, I was willing to sacrifice almost everything, including my own mental well being, to stand ten toes down in being treated as a first-class citizen amongst my peers on that show. I would not play small. I would not be a sidekick. I would not be secondary. And I'm very proud of that. I love that. I think you're beautiful. Do you think you're beautiful? Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, 
Yeah. Uh, I've, I've, I've always known I was beautiful in this particular way because I do beauty is obviously very subjective, right? But in like the kind of objective way in which the society picks and chooses who gets to be beautiful, mm-hmm. I've always felt chosen and in that number because I was a child actress and model. So from the age of five and six, I've had a comp card. I've known that my aesthetic was powerful enough to be paid for. It could sell a product. And if it could, if it can sell a product, Torrey, I knew it could sell a message. And it just so happens it could probably sell a message that says very much like Douglas's um, obsession and preoccupation with optics and photography and lens. These black people are really beautiful first class human beings and we should treat them better. I love that. Mm -hmm. I love that. I love how your beauty is wrapped up in your political. Oh, it's a form of protest. Yeah. My beauty is protest. It's a form of protest Mm -hmm. against a notion that would not include you. Like Mm -hmm. how could you not say Ebony is beautiful and thus you would say black women are beautiful. Sure. Yeah. There were so many times when I worked in LA as a, brief model actress um, that I would intentionally defy my agent and I would go on calls that did not want to see black women, that only wanted to see women of multiracial identity, that only wanted to see Hispanic women, that only wanted to see anything but black women, right? And I would go and they're like, but your name is Ebony. Like, I know. <laughs> and, um, and I would get cast some of the time. And then I get to tell the director, so you know what this means, right? You don't know what black women look like. <laughs> That's exactly what that means, because I'm not biracial. And no, no, you know, yeah. I'm just a black woman born of two black parents. Yeah. And if you had it your way, I wouldn't have even come to the fucking casting. Right. 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 You don't know what black women look like. Right. Right. He turned you down on paper, mm-hmm. and then we saw you. He's like, Oh, oh hell this yeah. is exactly what we wanted. She's dope. Yeah. 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 How about that? Everybody who comes on the show, I talk to them about what it means to be black. Mm. and I can tell you've thought about it and it's part of your mission. Mm -hmm. What does it mean to you? It means being disruptive to really painful, fatal even, ideals of social constructs of blackness. So being black to me, Torre, means an opportunity um, to correct false narrative of blackness Mm -hmm. in a way that I actually literally hope saves lives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You wanna Mm -hmm. shake up the way we see black, they see black people. And sometimes us too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sometimes us too, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. It's really interesting you said that because I was I was thinking about that from the beginning of my career that I want to write about rappers mm-hmm. in a way that expands mm-hmm. how people see blackness in America. Mm-hmm. It's bigger. They're not others. They're not aliens. They are our brothers, yeah. our cousins. They are interesting and fascinating. Mm-hmm. I think there was a class all shock thing of like, Mm -hmm. you know, they came from nothing. Mm -hmm. So they have that a particular culture because Mm -hmm. they're, you know, I think the segregation, the de facto segregation of the ghetto creates its own sort of culture. And when these rappers blow up, middle-class America's like, oh my God, look at this alien who has looks and ideas and ways of perspective that I've never seen. Well, yeah, because you don't go to the ghetto. So yeah. yeah, but he's also a normal person and we can deal with him or her as a normal person and not, and I saw other writers who were ahead of me as like looking at them as like, wow, look at these amazing aliens. They're Jane Goodall going to South Central to write about Snoop Dogg. I'm like, Snoop. There's a Snoop on every corner. Yeah, Snoop is, Snoop is my cousin. Yeah. Snoop is, you know, he reminds me of my uncle and my nephew and like, you know. Well, it's the same, right. We're saying the same thing. So like, and, and what I hope I was the first black woman on Real Housewives of New York and they rebooted the whole thing. And thank God now there's lots of beautiful black and brown women on that show. To your point, Torre, once you, once I occupy the space and I've like adequately disrupted your preconceived notion of what blackness, especially black women are and look like and act and sound and smell like, right? 
Now I got a, I'm not special. I'm actually not fucking special. I'm not a unicorn. I'm actually not exceptional. I got 300,000 black women just like me. They're called AKs. I got 300,000 black women just like me. They're called graduates of UNC. They're called cheerleaders from West Charlotte High. They're called the other little black girls that took piano lessons at Clara Jones's house in Charlotte, North Carolina. Yeah. So it's like the making it ordinary. Last thing. Yeah. Do you know what the baby's name will be? I do. You do? You have a boy girl and a a, a girl name and a boy name? Yeah, but I also know the gender of my baby because I'm doing IVF and I did... um, Genetic testing, so. Oh, so the embryo is already, I didn't know that. So the embryo is already gendered. Mm-hmm. So so you know if it's going to be a boy or girl, mm-hmm. and you have the name already picked out. Yes. Beautiful. And yes. What's the name? I'm going to tell you. Yeah, right, nigga. <laughs> <laughs> thanks so much to Ebony for a great interview, and thanks to you for listening. Torre Show gives you fuel to power your dreams because you can use your dreams like a rocket ship to blast you into a life you never imagined. You can make your dreams a reality, and maybe this show can help. You can find me on Instagram at Torre Show. Torre Show is written by me, Torre, and produced by Jennifer Brown. Our editor is Ryan Woodhall. Our engineer is Claire McHale. Our booker is Claudia Jean, and we're distributed by DCP Entertainment. And we will be back on Wednesday with more amazing guests. Because the man can't shut up.